of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Tonight we are welcoming four people into the full fellowship of the Church. Life in Christ is life in the new creation, life called upon to realize a whole range of tasks and callings defined by Christ and by Christ's ministry in time and eternity. You're all going to be anointed this evening. It's a fairly modest procedure, and I can assure you it doesn't hurt a bit. <laughs> but it signifies something of immense importance. The sort of people in the Bible who are anointed are prophets and priests and monarchs. And that is the risen life into which Christians are introduced, the life of the prophet, of the priest, of the monarch. And in the light of Christ, what are those callings for you and for all of us? It's rather a shame that the word prophet or the word prophetic is sometimes thrown around these days as if it simply meant people capable of making a nuisance of themselves. Sometimes the prophets of ancient Israel made very substantial nuisances of themselves, but the essence of their calling was very simple. To tell the truth. To see and to declare what their society needed to hear. To be a prophet is to be someone who speaks out, who names godlessness or injustice, violence, inequality, injustice, in whatever setting they find themselves, but also to speak out for the hope and the promise with which God surrounds us. When you and your confirmation tonight are anointed, it will be to become speakers out, those who declare unwelcome truths, but also hopeful truths in whatever context you find yourselves. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, which we pray for you tonight in that respect, is a gift of courage. Priests, too, are anointed. And once again, the task of the priest in Hebrew scripture is to be the person who keeps open the line of communication between the holy and the ordinary. The high priest in the first covenant is the one who passes into the holy of holies, that mysterious heart of the temple to make atonement, to make peace between heaven and earth, but comes out to declare this to the people. Your priestly task is to go on making that connection between the holy and the everyday. Because of the priestly work of Jesus Christ, who has passed into the inmost heavens, and taken us with him, you and all of us are given access to the heart of God's mystery. In silence and in adoration, we are taken into our ultimate home, and our worship and prayer here on earth are a preparation for that eternal silence and music, which is the adoration of God. But to be able to do that and to let it show through you and speak to others of promise, that 
is the task laid upon you in your priestly calling as members of this priestly community living in Christ the High Priest. You are to find the mystery of God in the heart of everyday experience, to look and listen for the mystery of God in every human face you encounter, to honour God and be aware of his presence and his summons in every experience of the day. Like the righteous figures of Jewish rabbinical theology, your task is to restore the glory above and the glory below into one harmonious whole. And so, what we pray for you in your calling as priests is hopefulness and insight. But what do we make of the calling to be monarchs? It sounds the most ambitious of all these callings. But let's think once again of how kings are spoken of in Hebrew scripture. You remember perhaps Psalm 72. Give the king thy judgments, O God, thy righteousness to the king's son, to judge the nations according to righteousness. The task of the king in ancient Israel was not just to govern, but to discern, to develop wisdom, practical and human insight, prudence, as the old books used to call it before the word became slightly embarrassing and archaic. Prudence in the sense of knowing how to get where you need to get, how to speak to the people you need to speak with, how to speak words of grace and promise and summons and challenge to others. Give the king thy judgments, O God. Give the king discernment and wisdom to see what matters in a situation to see how best to bring something of the light and justice of God nearer to the surface. To exercise that practical sense which will make ideals into reality. And so the prayer we pray for you as you receive the royal anointing is discernment. Courage and hopeful insight and just discernment. These are the gifts of the Spirit. Only by entering more and more deeply into the life of the Spirit of the risen Christ do these qualities come to light in our world. But our community, the community of the body of Christ, is called as a whole to exercise these things in a world where they're not always in abundant supply. We look around us and we see what the lack of courage may mean. Conformity, laziness of thought, short-termism, the inability to make necessary hard decisions for ourselves and our society. We see often a lack of silence, a lack of the space for the mystery of God to come alive in our midst and open our hearts in a deeper patience and a wider vision, a more hopeful sense of what our world might be. We see a world where the exercise of power and authority is so often without discernment, just discernment. Whether it is in the violence of war or the more casual injustices to which we so easily become habituated in our own society. In the midst of all this, call of the risen Christ 
is to live out those three dimensions of his own work. He himself is the way, the truth, and the life, the one who speaks the truth prophetically. He is the one whose eyes and heart are always fixed upon the mysterious depth of his father's love. And out of that depth, and out of his adoration of that depth, comes his healing and his service and his sacrifice. And it is he whose wisdom shapes the world afresh to be what it can be, to be true to what God has made it to be. Three of you have been baptized. One is still to be baptized tonight. One of you asked me the other day, what difference does confirmation make to the baptized? It's, to put it mildly, one of those questions that theologians spend a great deal of their spare time on. <laughs> and I will accordingly spare you the detail. But one thing we can at least say is that in baptism, it is as if, to use the great metaphors that this liturgy so often comes back to, it is as if you were dropped into the water to splash around, to roll around and paddle as you please for a bit. But gradually, the water becomes deeper and you need to learn to swim. And the gifts of swimming, the gifts of adjusting your body, yourself, to the currents around you, those are skills for which you need the teaching and presence of the Holy Spirit in a deeper intensity. And when tonight we pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon you in confirmation, in a fresh way, it's not as if you are meeting Christ or Christ's Spirit for the first time, but it is as if an extra capacity of responding to the currents of God's love flowing around you is created in you. And you can, like Jesus' own disciples, launch out into the deep. And that launching out into the deep, the depths of this needy, violent world, that launching into the deep is where you will be exercising those great gifts of prophecy and priesthood and royal discernment. We pray all these things for you tonight, but we pray too for ourselves and for the whole of our church, that these gifts may live in us, live visibly and audibly and tangibly in us, so that the life of the risen Christ encourage and insight and just discernment may bring hope to the world, the hope of Jesus' risen life and Jesus' everlasting victory, which tonight we celebrate, saying once again those words which are at the very heart of our faith. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.